and welcome to Erupt, the home for how businesses can scale and transform. Throughout this podcast, we aim to inspire and educate to help you and your business thrive. Across the course of our episodes, we'll be interviewing industry leaders to uncover some of the challenges across the world of work. We aim to give an insight into some of the fastest growing organisations across HR and technology. Please follow us on our journey to erupt and elevate your business. In today's episode, we discuss the topic of the language of change for continuous improvement versus the need for transformation with James Coughlin, Digital Transformation Advisor and Programme Lead at Bourne Group, Stan Horwitz, Change and OD Manager at Lloyd's Register, and Simon Williams, Programme Change Director at Cambridge University. But in the meantime, James, if I can ask you to kick off and just kind of give us a bit of a snapshot um, before we before we start the discussion uh, into your experience um, and, and, and a bit about yourself. Absolutely. Um, so I'm James Coughlin. Uh, I'm a digital director. I've been working in the digital e-commerce product and marketing space now for probably well over 15 years. Um, I have spent the last six, seven years focused on being an interim. What does that mean? It's been about uh, delivering uh, digital transformation programs for an array of organizations, helping them navigate through change. So conceptualizing that and then executing that strategy. Uh, Prior to that, I was the MD for digital uh, HMV post a very public administration back in 2013. And the first half of my career, uh, I started out in the music industry, in fact, which was probably the industry that felt the force hand of change uh, before anybody, if you recall the days of Napster and whatnot, Mm -hmm. Um, followed by Vodafone uh, at the launch of their content services and also a startup business that was developing bespoke mobile apps during the wave of the app frenzy in the early 10s. Fantastic. Thanks for that, James. And I'll ask you the same, uh, Simon, if you may. (laughs) Hi everyone, I'm Simon Williams. I'm Programme Change Director at uh, Cambridge University Press and Assessment, where I've been for about uh, three and a half years, um, amongst other things, leading a global uh, digital transformation programme for one of the world's largest tests of England, English as a foreign language. Um, my background prior to this was uh, nearly 22 years with Transport for London. Uh, started off in sort of commercial strategy, business development type roles, and then spent about 15 years in change and transformation programs and projects, operations, people, process change, uh, initially in in kind of uh, London Underground, which many of you may be familiar with the Tube in London, uh, mm-hmm. but also then later in in more sort of uh, corporate functions, uh, HR, finance, and, and um, operations, uh, environment, different safety, all different parts of the organisation really. So, uh, wide breadth of of, um, different sort of change and transformation programs and projects over the last um, nearly nearly sort of 17, 18 years now. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Um, And again, thank you, James. Uh, We are still waiting for Stan, but we will will start the discussion uh, and I'm sure he will join us in due course. So just a reminder, um, because I can see the attendees uh, going up as we speak, um, this session will be on the language of change, continuous improvement versus transformation. And I will kick off with the first question, uh, which is, what do each of you define transformation, continuous improvement? Um, what are the differences? Uh, at what point does each of them work best? And we'll start with, we'll start with yourself, James. Okay, great. Um, so transformation for me is ultimately defining the need or the intention for change. Um, so you could call it the strategy planning. Um, it's about putting a, a marker towards the North Star and saying, you know, this is where we need to be. Uh, this is the root. This is the why, the how and the who. Um, and continuous improvement is that recognition that having embraced or embarked on your transformation, you've made that step change for the better. And it's also about upkeep. It's whether that's people culture, technology, operational processes, or customer experience. It's about having subject matter experts uh, in place across your organization who are visible, who are willing, um, and who can also measure at a constant pace 
what is and what isn't working in a real world scenario. And ultimately it's about pushing for better. It's about keeping people on a journey to better outcomes. Um, when does it work best for me? So transformation uh, has to start in the boardroom. Um, it's about when an organization finds itself at the crossroads, taking that leap of faith, taking that risk to grow and to evolve, you know, whether that's outpacing the competition um, or whether that's to be the reason why customers choose you, uh, not just because they have um, or because they can for that matter. Um, for continuous improvement, that sort of comes post any major shift from legacy ways of working. Continuous improvement really helps people stay confident that the path is about staying on top of ourselves and that legacy is no longer an option. Um, it helps bring people on that journey and they can see that continued change effort. So whether or not something's working or isn't working, um, the intent is still there. Brilliant. And Simon, over to you. So I, I agree with a lot of what James has said, but I think what's interesting for me is if you'd asked me this question sort of three, four, five years ago, I'd have had a very clear sort of distinction that, that transformation was about uh, radical step change, strategic change, as, as James says, you know, starting from the boardroom, where do we want the organization to be in five or 10 years time? How are we going to uh, how are we going to to define that and and get there? And you had you know huge kind of uh, programs and, and teams to deliver that. And continuous improvement was much more evolution from within, from bottom up, from from the world that you're in on a day to day basis. But I think what's happened is that actually those things have got closer together because with the increase of of uh, agile techniques and iterative development and so on, actually you find that starting from the, the kind of continuous improvement space, but with some idea of the kind of the big picture direction, you can actually now uh, use some of the, the, the kind of the techniques that started in continuous improvement as a way towards delivering the bigger transformation. So I think the gap between the two is, is, is closing, not always, um, you know, depends how, how, you, how you use it and what the circumstances are. But I, I think um, that there's more blurring of the lines now between those two things than there was a few years ago. Mm. No, fantastic. And, and that kind of lends well to the, uh, to the next question. Um, and, and that is, what is the first step of a change program? Should it be understanding the language that we are going to be using? Is that for me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, 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 carry on. Yeah, so um, I think it's quite, it's quite interesting. I mean, I think language is an important part of uh, d defining what you're doing but really for me you know the, the first part of a change program is to be kind of defining the whole kind of concept of what you're trying to do so you know what, what if it is a, a strategic type of change what is the strategy of the business what problem are we trying to solve what are the the potential kind of building blocks that might be needed to do that and one of those elements is probably language um, but I, I don't think language alone is 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 enough you, you have to start to to understand the the environment that you're operating in the what are you trying to achieve the you know why have you got a problem that you need to solve what is that problem before you before you get too far down the uh, down the route of, of defining the the solution or defining exactly what you're trying to do right. and, and can i come to you with that same question james absolutely yeah so for me the first step has to be um due diligence and, and key stakeholder alignment um so making sure everyone like simon said is aligned on the desired outcomes and be honest with each other are we clear where we're heading um are we happy with the approach um i think then you know it's extremely important to get honest with with your employees as well you know because they're going to feel um the, the the change tidal wave coming through the organization at different stages so make sure you've got the feedback uh, mechanisms in play make sure that the employees feel they are part of the conversation um, making sure there's a clear escalation process for that real world impact to both your external um, and internal customers. Um, and, you know, touching on what Simon was saying that, you know, for me, it's about keeping the language clear and simple. Absolutely. Fantastic. And, 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 and to you again, um, James, how important is the communica communication piece uh, as to why we're uh, navigating the change? 
Oh, it's fundamental, absolutely. Um, one point I uh, should have tagged on to the end of the other question is, you know, you've got to, you've got to effectively be ready for a flatline hierarchy when it comes to change and transformation. Um, so, you know, pardon the political pun, but you're inevitably going to end up in a 4852 scenario, whether you like it or not. Um, so it's better to manage those expectations at every stage by all communication means open to you and promote that idea sharing as well you know remember employees need a voice during this change so whether the program lead has got the plan or the intentions already written you know be open for some bamboo flex as I call it you know because that might actually be the difference between a program success and any unforeseen derailment would you agree with that Simon yeah, ab absolutely. You know, communication is absolutely vital at, at every level. Um, it, it's about the alignment. It's about people understanding what we're doing and what they are going to need to do differently. It's about helping people um, gain, uh, gradually gain more kind of ownership and and gaining a stake in in what we're going to do. And 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 frankly, you know, w without this kind of uh, communication time and time again you know you, you see that change programs just fail to to deliver um what they set out to do because because people don't fundamentally understand it and, and buy into it but I, I would go further and say actually I, I think communication may be the wrong word because communication sometimes is sort of has a connotation of being kind of one way we're going to tell people what we're doing and for me it's much more about engagement it's much more about involving all of the people at every level and 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 as as james said making sure we're getting their their feedback their input wherever possible that they're actually involved in in creating it and i think that again that brings you back to how bridging the gap between continuous improvement and, and strategic transformation is quite helpful because that that's where you get that that greater engagement and ownership with the teams who are actually affected yeah yeah okay and and, and where does the role of organizational leadership versus uh, program leads um align james well it should it should be at the outset um to be quite honest um and i think it's important for all organizations to note that if there is any indication that uh, gaps are, are growing to call it out you know otherwise others will across your organization for you whether you like it or not and mm -hmm. um, so for me it's about uh, the leadership and program lead uh, being aligned and staying visible to those in the organization during the wave of change as well um, if i'm completely honest you know the legacy program lead approach or program director approach is is, is ever more challenged uh, here and now and certainly post pandemic you know so making sure you've got the structure of your organization uh, in order um you know it will leave some businesses questioning the need for program directors and um, perhaps they will be phased out uh, for the better in some cases yeah, you know it's about having the leaders in your organization that c suite um you know bringing down those barriers having the skills at that level um, to win teams acceptance and to help improve that culture and desire for change. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. And welcome to Stan Horowitz, who has joined us. Um, <laughs> hi, Stan. How are you? Hi, <laughs> real apologies. We had some technical errors with trying to get on a couple of times with wrong links, but I suppose that's the nature of technology, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And listen, it's not it's not a problem. Uh, we still have a couple of questions to get through. Simon, can you just follow up on uh, the question that I just asked James around where does the role of organisational leadership uh, versus programme leads align? Yeah, I, I think it's it's really important that they are they're fully aligned in terms of the message, in terms of the understanding of, of what's trying to be achieved. And, you know, frankly, if you don't have the organizational leadership, not just kind of um, pay lip service to it, but actually actively living and breathing and, and consistently throughout over time, um, you know, repeating that that message, then it's very hard to, to drive through the change. I mean, I've seen quite a lot down the years, you get people who sort of start off really enthusiastic at the start of a change, and then they the executives kind of lose interest and move on to something else. And surprise, surprise, you know, you, you don't deliver all the benefits that you set out to do. So you've absolutely got to keep those those C-suite leaders aligned all the way through and, and on message. Yeah, thank you. Stan, over to you. If you could just give us a, a snapshot, um, Stan, for those for those watching um, into your background um, and then I'll follow on with a question. 
Sure. So, uh, in terms of my background, I've been involved with organizational change and the more latterly transformation probably for the last 25 years, uh, consulting and working within, within different organizations across multiple change programs and transformation programs. Um, and obviously in different contexts. So different differences between change and transformation quite fundamental in my opinion, transformation being far more strategic and, and far more radical in its approach and a change of a system rather than a change to an incremental changes, which are normally associated with operational types of changes and, and continuous improvement. But yes, I've been involved with change and organizational change for, for decades. <laughs> Fantastic. And you, and you probably joined us for, for what I think is the best question. I'm certainly um, super interested um, in, in hearing all your views on this. Um, what are some of the best and worst change projects you've been a part of and why? <laughs> yeah, you use that question directed to me, Magnus? Yes, yes, Dad. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think, so obviously having worked across multiple industries and multiple sectors, I think the best change projects are without a question, I, I kind of want to pick on what Simon was saying, is when there's an alignment around strategy and meaning of language and understanding of commonality of terminology, I think also often we dive in to defining roadmaps and journeys without understanding the sequencing of the programs and what we're trying to achieve in terms of the language that's created up front. So if we take something like digital transformation, there's so many different definitions of it and everybody has different views on it. So I think that alignment has been the most successful around the programs that have succeeded where there's an understanding of the language up front and the meaning and that then translates into programmatic scope, um, you know, different programs of change and then the integration of those. Um, I think the failures that I've seen over, over many years have been where there's been lack of understanding or lack of alignment or different expectations, where expectations are, are X and reality in, the, in terms of the context is something that is often quite different. So, yeah, I, I think that's more broadly speaking. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Um, James, over to you. Yeah, okay, so um, in terms of the best um, transformation programs I've been involved in, uh, I would say the most recent one actually um, was was for a, a PE-backed um, global education, private education group. Um, and there was a fundamental need to migrate 50 school websites to a Drupal and AWS architecture from what had been a legacy uh, set up. And it happened during the midst of the pandemic. So to talk about a time where it was a world unknown to us all, what that did bring from a culture perspective and a motivational perspective was everybody was aligned at the outset. Everybody wanted um, and understood uh, the need for change um, and, and what it was we were aiming to achieve uh, at the outset so I think that really helped those working on the program and those involved in that you know sleeves rolled up at all levels of the organization uh, with a real desire for for better outcomes um, another one comes to mind uh, would be putting digital tools in the hands of customers in store in in the high street uh, on with, with the retailer that I've worked with I'm being coy on on the names um, but really seeing the impact of that across both on and offline uh, engagement by customers, which I think was a surprise to many. Uh, and also how that stretched out beyond just the short term into the medium and long term and still even today uh, for that business. Um, another one would be taking a B2B business that was heavily reliant on a global distributor network to have in its own uh, B2C owned e-commerce capability. Uh, for the first time, they were able to know the customer. They understood and leveraged the power of data. Um, and commercially, they realized as much as 30% additional margin versus that previous model. Um, so they're the good call outs. In terms of the worst, um, again, being coy on the names of the businesses, but you know, entering a business in the midst of an ERP multi-million uh, pound implementation that was inevitably scrapped for some of the reasons we've discussed here already. Stan just mentioned some. Uh, the program lead and the board being completely misaligned, disconnected um, from the get-go, uh, arguably, and then throughout. So uh, there was no alignment or understanding of why or what could actually be achieved. Um, you know, other examples would be my personal view is having the wrong people at the helm. Um, and I've also got a number of examples, which uh, I'll happily share with anybody uh, over a drink would be navigating, you know, PE backed businesses where you've got PE backed founders emailing you 24 seven, all hours of the day or night, um, seeking a change after the event. 
uh, which is is both costly and uh, <laughs> immoral in some cases. But but uh, yeah, I've got some interesting stories there as well. Brilliant, thanks, James. Over to you, Simon. <laughs> So, you know, lo loads of examples too. I mean, probably the, the, the one that was the greatest to be involved in actually was the, the, the London 2012 Olympic Games where you just had such a huge buzz. You had, you know, an unmovable deadline, stakeholders from top to bottom aligned, engagement with, you know, with everyone at all levels and with, you know, the, the kind of the wider, the customers and all the people who were who were visiting. And it, it was just a great vibe and a great thing to be, be part of. But... Um, more kind of, um, I suppose, kind of practically, the, the last big programme I was involved with when I was at, at Transport for London was around uh, re-engineering the entire operating model for stations, uh, changing working conditions for five and a half thousand people, rolling out use of mobile devices, bringing them out front of house from behind ticket offices, new machines, new processes, huge kind of combination of, of things to do in a, in a sort of um, environment where there's kind of a lot of challenging stakeholders, different la difficult labor relations issues and all of those kind of things. And that was the culmination of a, a 10 year journey where there'd been sort of three, three or four abortive attempts where, you know, the thing, the things hadn't gone so well, but it was the right strategy. And finally, we kind of learned the lesson of getting the alignment from top to bottom. I mean, if you, if you bear in mind, this was the time when uh, our current prime minister was the mayor of London and he'd been uh, petitioning that we wouldn't be closing ticket offices and we closed ticket offices on London Underground when he was the mayor. We had to get alignment from, from that level with all the external media and with all of the staff and the trade unions. And when you get that to that sweet spot where it's all right and you get everything aligned and everything comes together, that, that's really good. But there was a lot of learning of kind of abortive projects along the way and and you know you realize that if you don't get all those ducks in a row it doesn't matter if you've got the best strategy in the world if you've got you know the the, the all the right um the right ideas and the right things to do if the wind's not blowing in the right direction if you haven't got the sails aligned then then it's not going to happen thanks simon um okay fantastic we'll come over, back over to you stan um and this will be uh, the last question that we that I have, um, and that is, how do we build a culture uh, of acceptance to change? So I think a lot of it's been said in the very brief time that I've joined the call. So um, I, very, very much so. It's about alignment. It's about commonality of language, understanding what it is. And to me, what often gets lost is the complete repetition of the why, the benefits, not just at organizational level, but at individual level. And then it's really about starting to build that capability of understanding how individuals drive change because at the end of the day it's people that actually will either make the change a success at every level or not and so when we talk about hearts and minds it's not just alignment to it's actually believing in the purpose the rationale and um, the benefits of the change even in changes that are really difficult outsourcing programs or or things that, that possibly have a negative impact the way we align people and and kind of get people to buy into it through living values and ethics and, and doing the right thing all the way through is fundamentally important. So the buy-in comes by creating an understanding of change, the dynamics of change, what to expect, how we all go through change differently, how we experience change at individual level, and then working very strongly with groups of individuals and moving individuals into the why of the change from an organizational benefit purpose, but equally so from an individual benefit purpose. Um, and, 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 and trying to bring those two together as best as possible. And then creating a mindset of continuous growth, you know, really opening people up, exposing them to different things that um, how the world is changing, the world of work is changing, different technologies, how those are enabling different things for organizations, but equally so for us as individuals as we move into, into sing towards singularity in the fourth industrial revolution, et cetera. So I think that is fundamentally important to getting that culture of, understanding of how change impacts us individually and getting people more comfortable with change and, and ambiguity because that's that's the world we're in mm -hmm. for sure for sure and simon what are your thoughts on that so uh, yeah absolutely agree with with stan i, I think there's a an interesting point actually i saw in the, the chat that um people like to sort of bury their heads in the sand and, and sort of think well uh, if i keep my head down this change will move on and we'll move on to something else and the next bright idea will come along and actually we need to move to a world where you know change is continuous because change is good and change is how we grow and we don't need to be scared of change and how, how do we do that we do that by 
you know, by talking about it all the time, by talking about how do we improve, how can we do the job better, what would work better to to help us as a business by by measuring things, as as James was saying saying earlier, you know, um, what gets measured gets done, what what gets measured gets improved, and and we have to look at that. And you know, I, I'm a firm believer as well that the more we can we could do with you know people taking ownership themselves and and people um people developing the ideas and the change themselves rather than it being done to them it, you know makes much such a huge difference people don't, don't tend to destroy something they've had a hand in creating mm, yeah for sure and james would you would you agree with both simon uh, and stan yeah absolutely would agree with uh, everything both simon and stan have said there i'm going to come at it from a, a slight slant uh, on what's been said already um you know as 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 simon was rightfully just saying you know openness to acceptance is about the people it's the it's, it's within the individuals themselves um so i actually think businesses need to take a a, a long hard look at their hiring processes and um, before embarking on any change you know it's probably worth reviewing the hiring approach three to five years prior and is that in conflict am i trying to change a pool of talent reluctant um because we haven't set out our values and intentions clear all along um so um you know it's it's about a parallel approach you could force it through a, a parallel approach effectively um you can identify those who are willing to accept and embrace change versus those who straddle to the you know well this is the way we do things around here type scenario and you will answer your questions pretty quickly yeah. um and a lot of that will come with promoting a call it out culture um throughout the, the program for sure it's a growth mindset so growth mindsets and promoting growth mindsets openness brilliant fantastic i mean like i say there's been some really good interactions so we've got a couple of questions here will we get through them all i'm not sure um but if i can just ask everybody to keep it as concise um as possible so we can at least attempt um to to, to, to get through them um but thanks for some of that unbelievable insight and we'll kick off with the first question uh, so top of the list how does the narrative affect the transformation process uh james if you could kick off with that um uh, with answering that question that'd be great yeah i think uh for me you know what you're saying at the outset and and how you're relaying back to what was said at the outset at regular intervals as part of that communication to your employees and to those working on the program is going to be fundamental if people start to notice you're going awry or if you're moving uh, away from uh, what you'd set out to do that's going to create nervousness um, and then that's where I think programs run the risk of borning themselves into some sort of beast that that, that was never intended and um, so the narrative is is absolutely fundamental at the outset and getting that alignment on that narrative at the outset and then at any point you're providing whether it's town hall updates or um, board member updates what it, whatever it may be making sure there is that consistent alignment between every official communication coming from those responsible for the success and the outcomes of of the program brilliant thanks james um over to you, Stan. Does HR really understand the difference between project, program management, and change management? I mean, my experience, yes. I think HR um, over across multiple geography, ge geographies um, globally has come to a really good understanding of how programs are driven to, to change. And also they equally understand their role in that in terms of, you know, what James was saying earlier about the recruitment process and, and, and bringing in the right people and the right mindset. And I think that's becoming a lot more scientific and also more um, structured in terms of understanding what what we're hiring for rather than just skills so yes i, I generally do experience that there is quite a strong alignment generally speaking um even within hr's own transformation journey so mm -hmm. to speak um i think there's an understanding that hr itself is going through continuous change and and also transformation at the same time in terms of delivering different models and yeah. in different ways in terms of its service delivery so yes i mean, my my view is yes they do Brilliant. And to you, um, Simon, this is a fantastic question as well, actually. How can you get, sorry, uh, <laughs> more questions have come in, so I've actually lost my thread. Here we they've go. They've moved how, up and down a bit, I think. Yeah, yeah they've moved <laughs> up and down for sure. How, how do you avoid transformation fatigue uh, from people who are the end users, half of who just want to get on with their day job? 
Yeah, it's something that gets talked about a lot is this kind of, you know, overload and you've got so many different things coming from different directions, you almost don't know which way to look next and you're being, uh, you know, you're being rewarded based on your your delivery of the day job. I mean, I think there is, there is uh, part of the answer is about being conscious of the kind of the portfolio management implications and just thinking about what is the right sequence and what is the right agenda for for change organizationally as a business. But it is also about, as we've talked about already, moving the culture on to a place where change isn't sort of something that comes along and and hits you from different angles it's, it's that change is part of your life all the time and and uh it, it is part of the day job and and that that's i think the 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 dynamic that we we have to we have to move towards it's 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 not realistic to think you could just sort of keep your head down doing the same thing you've always done in the same way and and that change isn't going to come along so um, we, we need to, to change the, the culture of work so that so that change and improvement is, is just part of everybody's job all the time. We've got a couple of minutes left. So what I'd be really keen to do is just to get final takeaways um, from from each of you, starting with Stan. Yes, I think my big question, and sorry, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the session, but it really does boil to the narrative of the difference between change and transformation and continuous change and transformation. And I really don't think that they're the same. I think the, the myth is believing that they are the same. It's the same as digital transformation, I believe, is a myth. And I'm going to be probably hammered for saying that. But I believe continue, you know, digital is a, is, a, is a continuous process of evolution. Whereas business transformation says different markets, different segments, different value creation, doing things that are radically different from our current model and our current way we are operating. And, and it's bringing people and aligning them to the purpose of the organization, that people feel that that change is a constant for them and something that they believe in because they understand the value and the impact that socially the business and the organization actually has in the environment and the context it's operating in. And I think that alignment to building that change capability is fundamentally important, that, that personal ability, resilience for change. And I guess it does also boil down to recruitment, but it, it also can be built within the organization simultaneously. Brilliant. Over to you, Simon. So really interesting just hearing Stad's comment there, because as I said at the start of the session, I, I think I was very much in, in that camp three, four, five years ago. And I, 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 you know, kind of, I, I, I see that these things are coming together a bit. But actually, the, the biggest takeaway for me, I think, is that doing the right stuff, getting the alignment, getting the communications and the engagement right, creating the right kind of environment where people see that they need to Im improve and, 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 and that change is, is just part of, part of what we do. Doing those right things is always the right thing to do, whether it's a strategic transformation or whether it's more kind of continuous improvement evolution. And maybe, you know, this whole session is about the language of change maybe language is helpful to a point but maybe we shouldn't get hung up on language maybe we should just focus Agreed. on doing the right things agree brilliant and last but not least james give us your yeah thoughts. no thank you um so i think likewise adding on to to what the guys have said already you know whatever the sector uh, whatever the size or scale of business um you need honest leadership um, and you need that constant clear communication as we've talked about managing those expectations at every stage and it's that it's those pillars there that will underpin the framework um, to successfully or to achieve in bringing people along that journey uh, of course you've got to stay poised um, and ready to face inevitable challenges and overcome whatever comes your way and you've got to do that by having a solutions focused mindset at all times um, I would say that uh, ultimately, you know, the true measure of success um, for, for all organizations embarking on change is going to be the last in impact um, of those that say they can versus those who truly believe we must. And uh, finally, uh, my one point would be to say there's a there's a lot happening in the hiring space at the moment for, for digital talent. Um, recruiters are extremely busy in uh, seeking out digital natives. One thing I would say is, um, and hooking that onto something I mentioned before, is we must be very, very careful, recruiters and businesses alike, not to backfill what I call backfill hire on, on digital, making sure you've got the right leaders in situ 
should be where your focus is because otherwise if you continue to backfill uh, higher you will end up with uh, we'll end up with a very interesting bubble over the course of the next 18 months having gone through uh, what we all lived through with the pandemic and the impact on higher and thereafter brilliant some absolutely fantastic takeaways um there guys in addition to uh, some of the great insight that we got throughout the throughout the discussion anyway thank you very much this podcast was brought to you by Annapurna Arapt. If you enjoyed this episode, please visit our Go Arapt website to get involved in our regular podcasts, video footage and live events throughout the year. Thank you for listening.